We extend a Christian greetings to each of you this morning and want to welcome you to this appointed moment in God's calendar, in God's time schedule. We're here to commemorate and to be an encouragement to one another in behalf of the passing of Sister Katie, who has been one of our charter members, one of the few that still remained. And uh, we certainly have appreciated our connection with Sister Katie and Yuri and the Schrock family. Our acquaintance with the family has spanned a grand total of 44 years, and that I guess then when I hurt someplace, well, that reminds me that I'm aging too, so uh, it's part of life. One of the things that, just a few reflections, but one of the last times that we visited Sister Katie, as we went into the house, as she couldn't see, and, but she was very keen on her perception of voice. And... Uh, we asked her how she's doing, and she would say, I'm counting my blessings. And then Thursday on Thanksgiving Day, God took her home. And, uh, and so that's uh, an interesting note. Sister Katie wasn't perfect by no means whatsoever, but her desire, her heart's desire was to serve her master. And to be a godly woman after God's heart. And uh, that was always a challenge to us as a family to visit them and to share in their experience. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it says, It appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment. And we all have an appointment. And we don't know when that appointment is going to be. But we all have an appointment with God. And Sister Katie was called on Thursday for that appointment. And, uh, you know, man's life, according to the scripture, is three score and ten. And by reason of strength, four score. But she superseded that. She was 90. And uh, even though her last number of years, she was kind of out of the... The church attendance, she hasn't been in church for a number of uh, quite a while, but yet she'll be missed because that was a hub for the cottage meeting groups uh, that, that uh, spoke will be removed, and so she will be missed. And uh, I want to publicly bless the family for their efforts in caring for their mother especially the girls, their commitment to caring for her. And, and uh, there's a special blessing in that. And the memories that were created during that time will be treasured for the rest of your life as well. I believe that Sister Katie's heart's desire was to please her Lord, and that was evident by her life, and uh, it was also I believe it was her heart's beat to see that her children walked in truth and her grandchildren, and I think that was a, uh, a desire that she had in her heart, and uh, you know, we think about our relationship with the Lord and, you know, that invitation that she answered in her response to the call of God on her life. Jeremiah 33, 3 states this. It says, Call upon, unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And who of us would have known the increments of life and the experiences that we had, but yet God had that all in plan and... Uh, he has shown us those things day by day. Second Peter 1.10 says, Therefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And I, I believe that is that was Sister Katie's reflection of her heart. 
to her family and to her, those whom she came in contact with. Her desire was to uh, show them the light and to reflect the light that she has experienced in her own life. And so most of you have, if you not, received a bulletin, gives you the order of the service. I'm not going to go over that. We're just going to follow the order of the service that is laid out in the bulletin. So let's begin our worship uh, with song, Brother Anthony. The first song for this morning is Farther Along, and it is 72 in the Songs of Life and Praise. 72.
117. Love will bring us all together. 117.
Christian greetings to each one here that has come to pay their last respects to our dear sister Katie, the one that we have loved so well through the years. And um, while Brother Ray shared from the church experience, I, as a close neighbor to the Schrock family, I share from that perspective a bit. And, um, and uh, God has come again and has called one home to come home. Called out of her family, called out of the community and neighborhood, and called out of the church here. And um, we're trusting this morning that our loss is heaven's gain. Psalms 116 verse 15 tells us that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And um, gone to bloom above was a little note that was, came along with the message that Katie had passed away on Thanksgiving Day morning. As I pondered the, the passing of our neighbor, our sister in Christ, and uh, <clears throat> my mind traveled back through the years of especially the unique little community that we live in up there. Uh, I'd say within a mile radius in each direction of the Schrock home, the Schrock farm. And I just pondered of the many different ones that have died within that radius of a mile or so from e in each direction from where they had lived. And I think went back to Yuri's parents, Owen and Melinda Schrock. They, we know them from their, from their being a tailor and making the plain suit. And uh, I was... One of those had received one of those from them. Remember as a young man in their home and um, preparing for that. Then I think of the weeklies west of the farm there, the next farm west. And um, they're gone as well. And then Herb and Jean Long right across the road from their drive. And uh, some of us remember when she was the art teacher in the Apple Creek School. And um, they, too, have gone on before. And um, I think of the next house east, and there were the Ivan Baker, Mr. and Mrs. Ivan Baker. They have left us, and they're gone, have died. On down the road, on McQuaid Road, is Forrest and Lola Eby. And, um, and um, Lola was a... Um, uh, worked in the cafeteria at the Apple Creek School, and we remember her well for that. I'm sure that some of the children here can. And, um, and then still farther down the road are my parents, and uh, they're gone as well. And then to the north is Mr. and Mrs. Tom Marthy. These all have passed away and are gone. And uh, while these names are not significant to most of you, there's something about that that I think needs some recognition, and that is the fact that the people that have once stood in the front lines in our communities and in our neighborhoods, people that we knew well, and, uh, and now they're gone, and now both Yuri and Katie are gone. And it's a reminder of the fast, fast fleeting away of time day after day, year after year. And um, it's also a reminder to all of us that while they have stood in the front lines now, who is standing in the front lines now as far as the age? And uh, you, know, you know where that places us as, as uh, the next generation. Ecclesiastes 1.4 says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. And Hebrews 13, 14 tells us that, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And James 4, 4, verses 13 and 14, we have the brevity of life, for it asks the question, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth a little time, and then vanisheth away. Then my mind went to Psalms 39, and I'd like to read some verses there, and uh, just consider... Uh, a few thoughts there. I want to go to Psalms 90 and read some there. Then at last I want to read Psalms 34, which I, as I read, I understand it was a 
favorite of uh, Sister Katie, and I want to read that as her testimony of her life, and I believe that we can give her that recognition this morning. Psalms 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity, Selah. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up treasures, and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Foolish, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with, with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears. For I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. O spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. I like especially verse Four, where it says, Lord, <clears throat> make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. None of us here this morning can, can um, as a Christian, decide what day that God will come call us home. We, know, we don't know that. And yet the call of this scripture is, is to make me to know mine end and uh, what it is the measure of my days and what it is that I may know how frail I am. And I think there's some things, though, that as we consider the, the fact of knowing my, the measure of my days, that somehow we can understand uh, God and his working. And we understand that even though we don't know that end day, we know that as we are a part of his people and that we are truly born again and are a Christian, that we understand then we come to that day that all will be well with our souls. And uh, we, we claim that this morning. How do we measure our days? And uh, is the question. And um, I just went down through this chapter and just picked out a few points. Verse 5, we understand our lives without God. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. And then it says, man at his best state is altogether vanity. We understand that we understand our lives when God is not within us. Our best state is altogether vanity. In verse 7, we understand our need for God. In verse 8 through 11, we understand what is in our lives that is against God. It's our sin that stands in the way. And, that which, um, and then verses 12 and 13, we understand the need to cry out to God. And uh, through that, it finally brings us to the condition of being right with God through the saving power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to just turn now to Psalm 90. And this is a very comparable psalm to the one that we have just read. It has a verse in there that says that, um, Make us... So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Very comparable to make, a, make me to know my end and, um, and the measure of my days. So teach us to, to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And I'm sure that there's a number here that understand the, the German. I like the translation better there, whereas I, if I have translated it correctly, it says... Teach us to think that we must die or will die so that we will be wise. And uh, isn't that a part of this thing of understanding and measuring our days this morning? As we understand that, um, that uh, we, we must consider the fact that we will die someday and that we will face the end of our lives and, and be ushered into eternity. Make me to think that we must die so that we will be wise. And I, I appreciate that so much. And uh, as we move on into this aspect of God, and I would like to read now verses 12 through 17 of Psalm 90. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. 
O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Now as the result of what happened in Psalms 39, now let's look at the, the work of God within us. The experience of the joy of salvation. The happiness that is talking about here. The gladness. The joy of salvation because of the work of God within us. And uh, we go on and we just pull out of this portion. We spend our days, the, each day of our lives as committed to God. And, uh, and we find a life, the purpose of life as a servant of God. And uh, just wanting to be useful. And, and I just see our sister Katie just shining out through this experience. And you just envision all that we've experienced by her lingering four years longer than her husband, Yuri. And, um, and uh, just um, all that we've experienced by going and visiting with her and uh, just hearing her share her testimonies and all of that. She wanted to be useful for God even in the closing weeks and days of our life. And I'm, I know that she has prayed for others. And I think all of you can understand that as well. She has been very faithful in, in praying. And uh, even in the midst of her suffering, she was, she was thankful. And thankfulness is, is a part, was a part of her life, you know, even in the midst of, even in the fact that she was legally blind. And uh, we just rejoice in, the, in that kind of a testimony as we think of our lives as a testimony of God. And, in, and um, I'm especially impressed in verse 16, and thy glory unto their children. You know, when there's that kind of an influence in our homes this morning, the influence that it has in our children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, and hopefully on through the many generations yet to come if the Lord tarries. And then finally, at the end of this passage, I believe it's, it's what it is owing our lives back to God. And, um, you know, as we understand all of these, all of these aspects of how we are relating to God, we understand how to measure our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And uh, we understand what it'll take from our lives and, uh, and that we will, that final day, be prepared for that blessed day when God comes to call you and I home. Someday we know that that time is coming. And even though we don't know when it's going to happen, and yet if, uh, if it's to happen before Christ returns, we know that we all must depart this life. And um, now let's go now to Psalms 34. And I, as I read this psalm, I just see Katie's life just shining out. This was a favorite uh, chapter of hers. And I just see her as shining out in this, is this uh, chapter. And, um, and she, was a, she was a mother in the home, a mother that loved children and, um, and others as well. She was a mother in the home that reached out to others. And uh, I know of some of those that have, have gone through their home even besides their own children. Now, I often was blessed with her sharing some of the stories of some of the experiences that, that she went through. Well, I see uh, her husband, Yuri, as, as the head of the home, I see, um, I see Katie as the heart of the home, as we think, and, and the blending of those two together, and the blessed state that that happened uh, for, for the children and the grandchildren. And now as we read Psalm 34, let's just let these words somehow uh, permeate our experience this morning. Psalms 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her, bo her boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Will magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked on him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. 
The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of all of them. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. You just see Katie's life shining in this portion of Scripture. This, this was her life. This was her testimony. And I believe in all, her thank, all of her suffering and affliction, there was always this thankful spirit that came out thanking people for caring about her and uh, caring for her. And um, I understand that one of the songs to be sung yet is, is, a, is, um, is a choice of, um, because of her saying that, um, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. And uh, we look at Psalms 34 and just let this portion of Scripture be as a record of her testimony this morning. May God be praised as we are gathered together to, to lay away our loved one, and may he receive all the honor and glory for his work, the beauty of his work that we can observe in this, in this life. We're going to stand now for prayer. <clears throat> Almighty Father in heaven, we pause in your presence again this morning. We thank you and honor you as God, the one that has given life and the one that has come down and has taken one out of this life into eternal life. And we thank you and praise you for your faithfulness to all of us here this morning. We ask your special blessing on this assembly. May your word go forth and touch our hearts and lives. May your name uh, be honored and, and reverenced, and uh, may we be faithful people as we, as we consider our lives today, and just bless the further service we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In your songbook racks, you will find song sheets. There should be four per bench, so just spread them out so everybody can see. Um, we're going to begin with Count Your Blessings, and as was mentioned several, several times already, this isn't normally considered a funeral song, but I believe this morning it can be. So, um, as was mentioned, Katie was always counting her blessings, and I th think she would want us to count our blessings this morning as well.
If you flip your papers over on the back side, I wonder, often wonder. Katie Schrock of Worcester passed away on Thursday, November 25, 2021, at her home, surrounded by her family, at the age of 90 years, 8 months, and 6 days. She was born in Charm, Ohio, on March 19, 1931, to the late Adam and Levina Yoder Miller, and married Yura O. Schrock on April 28, 1952. He died June 9. 2017. She is a member of Sunlight Chapel near Maysville. She is survived by children Levi and Katie Ann Schrock of Shreve, Edna, Carol, and Doris Schrock, all of Worcester, and Ruby Schrock of the home, six grandchildren, 16 great-grandchildren, 
his sister Edna, Mrs. Jonas A. Miller of Fredericksburg, and his sister-in-law Viola, Mrs. of the late Jonas A. Miller of Fredericksburg. In addition to her parents and husband, she was preceded in death by a great-granddaughter, her brothers Jonas Miller and Eli and Ada Miller, sisters Emma Miller and Anna Miller, two stepbrothers Alfred Stutzman and Dan Stutzman, and two stepsisters, Sarah, Mrs. Perry Chupp, and Ella, Mrs. Alvin Slabaugh. The family wishes to thank everyone for their expressions of sympathy, the visits, prayers, food, and help in every way is appreciated. I'm going to read the poem that's on the back of your bulletin. The title is Mother. As I look back upon the past, I think of Mother Dear. The many things she did for me make me long that she were here. It was mother knelt beside my bed and taught me how to pray. She read to me the scriptures and what the Lord did say. Oh, there's no one like a mother, none so tender, kind, and true. Whether in good health or sickness, she will always stand by you. There's no substitute for mother. I don't care what people say. There's no one just like another, just like mother can dry the tears. Yes, always be kind to mother. She is your best earthly friend. Though all the world forsake you, on mother you can depend. Remember hasty and bitter words to mother you love the best will cause you the deepest sorrow when she is laid to rest. Let mother see your loving smile and give her words of cheer too late when in her coffin than your words she cannot hear. So while on earth you have her, show your gratitude and love. Give her gifts and all your kindness, ere she's called to heaven above. Oh, it's hard to part with loved ones, first one and then the other, but it cuts the very heartstrings when we say goodbye to mother. When I reach my home up yonder, the two faces I would see, I want first to see my Savior, then have Mother come to me. I was also asked to share some reflections, I guess, from my perspective. And I guess as we drove in the driveway on Thanksgiving Day, and I saw this large, I don't know what kind of tree it is, but this large tree laying down that was cut down. I somehow just had to think of that as a symbol of Katie's life. Her work on earth was over. As I th uh, think of my interactions with Sister Katie, we enjoyed going to visit in the Schrock home. Katie was a person that had a sense of humor, and I guess I often found myself drawing that out of her, and we had many a chuckle and many a smile uh, when we visited her home. As I reflect on her life, You'll have to excuse me this morning. I'm not a school teacher, so I could alter the spelling of words. But Katie starts with a K, and so I came up with two more words, and that's courage and concern, and I started them both with a K, and I know that's not correct. But it was already mentioned about her strong spirit, her stamina. In spite of all her physical ailments and the pain that she suffered, she was always of strong spirit. I thought about her concern, and that was already mentioned, her concern for her family. And it wasn't only for her family, it was for all of us. You know, when we visited there, she remembered the names of probably each one of our children, and she would ask about them. But you know, as we were sitting there visiting, it wasn't long she would ask, where's Ruby? Where's Carol? Where's Doris? She was concerned about her family, and that was in part probably because of her failing eyesight. But you know, as I thought about that, she has entered a new phase, and that's her heavenly home. And I would just like to throw out this challenge. We use our imagination, but I had to wonder how long is she enjoying her heavenly home until she starts to look around. She asks, where's Levi? Where's Ruby? Where's Doris? Where's Carol? Where's Edna? And I'm sure she knows the name of all the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. And she's going to be looking around, asking, where are they? Are they coming? She's on the other side. She's looking, and she's waiting for you. Don't disappoint her.
I greet you in the name of Jesus this morning. The name above all names and in the name that I can offer hope and comfort to you as a family. Oh, to lay one to rest without the hope of Jesus. Well, we heard this morning already of Katie's interest in Scripture and how her Bible is well used. And I got to hold her Bible, I got to look at her Bible, and her old Bible was so worn that the pages were brittle and breaking, and just blessed me to look at that. So this morning I want to I wanna challenge us with following the shepherd. Following the shepherd. When we made funeral plans, I just asked what they would like the message to be on this morning. And they said, well, some of her favorite scriptures are, and they gave me two, Psalm 23 and John 14. So I took her Bible along home, and I opened it, and I looked at it. And these two passages I decided I was going to um, focus on because they were given as a suggestion. And in her Bible, she had Psalm 23 in a bracket and John 14, 1 through 6 in a bracket. And I doubt if she knew when she put the brackets there that she was highlighting her funeral sermon. But that's what we want to look at this morning. Following the shepherd. Katie's testimony of being thankful and counting her blessings. And then God calling her home on Thanksgiving is noteworthy, as already mentioned. God answered her prayers, but he was a long time in doing so. She was blind and counted her blessings. It was an inspiration to hear her in her bed, where she died, singing that very song. And she was an influential mother, as we can see in the family. Church family, there lies before us one who was an example of how to live in faith and how to die in faith. You see, for the way we live is the way we die. And as was mentioned, Katie had a good dose of humor, and it served her well when she had visitors. But Katie wouldn't want us to preach about her humor. Neither would she want us to preach about herself. But I am certain that she would want us to preach about her shepherd that was none other than Jesus Christ. Turn with me in your Bibles if you have them to Psalm 23. One of her favorite passages, and I'm sure she had many. Can you imagine or do you believe this morning that this portion of Scripture is a reality for our sister? A reality of a life well lived of 90 years, a faithful living, that this Scripture is a reality. And it can be a reality for you and I this morning if we're going to follow the shepherd. But my question is to you, who is your shepherd? All the world has a host of things they follow and shepherds that they follow that they would prefer over the one and only Jesus Christ. Following the shepherd, the one shepherd. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I had not realized that this was a favorite of hers, but I had read it to her when we would visit. Psalm 23. I wonder if it was precious because of her experience in life. 
Could it be that because she was blind, the shepherd was all the more precious to her that it talks about in the scripture here? And that her shepherd was the same shepherd David is penning about. She could not see. But she followed the shepherd by faith. She felt secure and safe in the arms and in the care of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. Can you say with David that the Lord is my shepherd? The first phrase of verse 1, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. That is a current relationship. And it was a current relationship for David. And it was a current relationship for Sister Katie. But the fact of the matter there is, maybe somebody here this morning is saying that he was my shepherd one time. That's a terrible thing to think and consider. Or maybe we're here this morning and say he will be my shepherd by and by. It's another horrible place to find ourselves in if he is not our current shepherd today. Plain and simple phrased, the Lord is my shepherd. And it must be our experience. Do you believe that Jesus continues to be Sisters Katie Shepherd today? Do you, do you think maybe that he was just her shepherd in this life? No, the promises is far greater in this life and the next. But if he's not our shepherd in this life, he will neither be our shepherd in the life to come. This passage here tells us that this shepherd that David is writing about will do a few things for us. That's what shepherds do. And this shepherd takes an interest in every single one of his sheep. But alas, we must be one of his sheep. So I see that in this passage that the shepherd is going to do for us in verse 2, it says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He cares about our comfort and our rest and he will take his sheep and he will place them in the best environment he can for their best interest. And sometimes we don't feel very comfortable in that environment. But God, but Jesus will place us and lead us in places that he knows is best for us. He's concerned for our well-being. Verse 2, something else that he does, and a shepherd does very well, and is that he, he leads. And with this says, he leads me beside the still waters. He cares about our thirsty souls. He gives us water to drink. Today he gives us living water. So that his sheep that are following him will survive. Living water. Verse 3, what, something else that this shepherd wants to do. It says, the shepherd restores the soul. Did you ever consider that phrase? It restores the soul that we sold to the devil because we lived for ourselves. And he takes and he restores that. And he transforms us. And he gives us a new heart. That's something this shepherd will do when we are his sheep. And we will follow him. Do you believe that Sister Katie had her soul restored? Our soul can be restored by the shepherd. In verse 3, there's something else he does. It says that he leads us in paths of righteousness. He leads us in a highway of holiness. He calls us to holy living and then he leads us in a narrow way. And when we're in the narrow way, we need to follow the shepherd. Those who are on the wide path and the, the broad path oh, don't really need a shepherd. They will all flow along. He leads us in paths of righteousness, which is the way that he wants all men to go. But will I? We will not if we don't follow the shepherd. He's the leading. Will I follow? 
Verse 5, something else he does. He's concerned for our nourishment. It says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. He so cares about our soul that he will nourish us in, in the view of all the world. That all the world can see that this shepherd nourishes his sheep. In the presence of our enemies, he continues to nourish and meet the needs of his sheep when we are his sheep. Another thing that this shepherd will do, it says in verse 5, Thou anointest my head with oil. He anoints with healing for our pain. That's what this shepherd that David is writing about is going to do for you and I. And I like to think that Katie experienced that very late in her life, in the latter years of her life. The anointing, healing, touch of Jesus. And when that takes place, it says, My cup runneth over because you and I are not able to contain the blessings of Jesus Christ on our lives. It just flows out. We get filled up. We can't contain it. David understood that experience, and you'll never experience it unless we're following the shepherd. Following the shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Well... In verse 4 that we skipped over, we do not know just where this path is going to take us. When Jesus is our shepherd, we don't know just where these paths... If you look at your bullet, then the road ends just very... or makes a hard, sharp bend on the cover of the bulletins this morning. And beyond that, we don't know. But we're following a shepherd who knows what lies beyond the bend. We follow by faith as the shepherd leads. But here in this portion of Scripture, in verse 4, David speaks of a walk that every living person must take. He understood what it meant to go through valleys and come out the other side. He was a a valiant soldier. He knew what valley experiences were. And he could write and he could pen this. But what it says here, if you look up the meaning, is simply the grave. When we go through the valley of the shadow of death is the grave. It's a walk that every man must take. Are you going to take it alone? It's a walk every man must walk alone in that we cannot take another with us. Sister Katie slipped away on Thursday morning alone. And when we have the shepherd, we can walk that valley, but we can never take another along. No two can walk this road, even spouses. It's just as salvation is an individual experience, so is the valley of the shadow of death is an individual experience. It's simply a grave experience. Husbands and wives, spouses, you have walked through valleys together throughout your marriage and throughout your life, but when you come to the valley of the shadow of death, you will walk it alone, and unless you have Jesus Christ as your shepherd, you are going to go the valley alone. And that is what is so difficult with parting, is that the one that goes before, as Katie has done, goes alone without us. But there's a preparation that it needs to take place for that final walk through the valley. And it begins back in verse 1 where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. That's where it all begins. The Lord is my shepherd. And if he is not our shepherd, he cannot and will not walk with us through the grave experience. The hand that you're holding today is the hand that will walk or hold your hold through the valley of the shadow of death, and is that hand Jesus this morning? Oh, to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and discover the hand that I've been holding was mine very own. We need a shepherd, we want a shepherd. And the reason this is comforting to me in walking through this grave experience with a shepherd is because it says his rod and his staff, his rod of defense and discipline and his staff of enabling us to walk along with us. 
that when the saint of God walks through the valley of the shadow of death, the evil one cannot touch the saint. There is hope. I'm confident that Katie is still holding that hand of her shepherd. If it is not the hand of Jesus that you hold when you enter the valley of the shadow of death, you'll never come out of that valley. So if Psalm 23 is our experience, then we can better understand why John 14, 1 through 6 was so precious to Katie. So we discover that there is a shepherd in Psalm 23. David wrote about it. But in John chapter 14, we discover just who this shepherd is. In John 14, 1 through 6. This is the shepherd that Jesus, that David was writing about. So we have Jesus just having the experience with his disciples, washing their feet. Then he tells them one of them is going to de- um, betray him and one of them is going to deny him. And now their hearts are all troubled, like some of ours might be this morning because of a passing of a loved one, and our hearts are troubled. And, and then Jesus has something to offer, but we've got to, he's got to be our shepherd. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, or how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You see, I said that this is the shepherd that David was writing about, was Jesus Christ himself, and Jesus Christ is revealing himself to you and us, to you and I this morning, and to the disciples, and to the John, the the, the writer here. But in order to benefit from the promises and the truths, it begins in verse 1, it says, Believe also in me. I said it starts with him being your shepherd back in Psalm 23. Here it is that we must believe in Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. And he must be our Savior. It's a personal choice. Recognizing Jesus Christ as the Son of God in our need of a Savior, in our need of a shepherd. Are these promises that I'm going to show you this morning, these promises are not going to become a reality until we do what Jesus says here, believe in me. Oh, he desires for all men that they would just believe in him. We must confess that we are a sinner and the need of the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from sin. To not believe is to be eternally lost. But we're talking about believing in Jesus and having him as our shepherd. Now I said in in Psalm 23, that the shepherd likes to do a few things for us. Well, right here in John 14, the shepherd, Jesus Christ, promises to do a few things for us. He says, he promises to go, to prepare, to come, to receive, to take all who believe on him. It's a beautiful thing. says, I have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The promises, five things that he will do for us only when he is our shepherd. Now, we have Thomas asking a very profound question. Notice their hearts were troubled. And Thomas asks this, We know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? A simple question. How can we know the way? Well, we follow the shepherd. And that's what Jesus was trying to get him to understand. You know the way. But maybe it's because their hearts were troubled. Maybe there's folks here this morning that aren't sure of the way. But Jesus said, you know the way. 
We know the way when Jesus is our shepherd. All too many times I take for granted that folks just know the way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. I just think that men ought to know that. Well, we must follow the shepherd. Well, Jesus gives him a, a profound response to the question, how can we know the way? He says, I am the way. And there you have it, the shepherd that David was talking about. The way is a road, a journey, or a course of life that leads to the Father, the Heavenly Father, to leads to the heavenly mansions, Jesus is telling them, it's got to be through me, Jesus Christ. It's always present tense, notice, in that phrase. When Jesus is speaking, how would it be if he says, I will be the way, I will be the life, I will be the truth? No, it's present tense. Neither would it sound real well or sound real good if he would say, I was. But it's I am, I am, present tense, current. Well, the proverb writer has something to say about a way. In Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Oh, man is so willing to take all the alternative ways. And the proverb writer says that you could take all those ways that are, seem right in my own eyes and you bring them all together and they all end up at the same place and it is death. And why would a man ever take a journey that he knows ends in death? When we know that we have a shepherd that will lead us into life everlasting, but man still likes to choose his own way and convince himself he is right. There is a way that seems right unto a man, and it is not the way, the truth, and the life. The way. Jesus showed us the way through his doctrine, through his example, through his sacrifice, and through his spirit, that he is the way. And we need to believe. We go back to the first part. We need to believe. Then he says he is the truth. Truth is the fact. Jesus is the Word, and the Word is truth. John 1.17, But grace and truth cometh by Jesus Christ. And then John 8.32, He says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, but you cannot be free unless we recognize that we were once in bondage. And that is how truth can set us free. Truth teaches us the knowledge of God and directs us to God, and directs us in the way. And then Jesus said, I am the life. Well, if you're here this morning, you're probably living, which means you have life. Jesus said, I am the life, eternal life. The life that now is in the life that is to come. Do you think our sister had to wait till Thanksgiving morning to experience eternal life? I think not. Eternal life is when we're following the shepherd and we're following his way in truth and in the light. We can experience eternal life today. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So we need to be dead first, and then we can live in eternal life. My question is, is this your experience? Is this my experience? And he says something else at the end of that verse. He says, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Did you know that if you're following the shepherd, you have the most greatest opportunity to come to the Father when you're one of his lambs. To come to the Father is to obtain favor and to have access to his throne. We have access to the throne of God this morning. And we can enter into his kingdom. But he must be our shepherd. By the way of the shepherd. The way. A lot could be said about the way that Jesus is talking about. So is your heart troubled this morning? Well, Jesus really specializes in calming the troubled hearts. 
He specializes in calming the troubled hearts of his sheep. Because he is the shepherd, he likes to do things for his sheep. And we looked at that. But there's a condition that must be met. And that condition is to believe and to acknowledge and to accept that Jesus is the Christ. He is the shepherd. Katie is experiencing something that no one here has ever experienced yet. Found in our scripture in the words of Jesus. Katie is experiencing something that no one has experienced yet. I will come again and receive you unto myself. What an experience! To be received unto himself is another personal experience. Receive you unto myself. A new body, clear vision, legs that walk freely, and hands that once again can work. Can you think about that? The experience of a new body. Not the crippled hands you saw here in the coffin, but new body, hands that work and eyes that see and legs that walk. I don't know how it is over yonder. But I claim the promises of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. It's a reward for a life well lived for Jesus Christ. But we must follow the shepherd. Not just any shepherd. The great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for being a shepherd willing to do things for us. Doing the things that we cannot do for ourselves. as saving our souls. I pray that you would bless the family here in the remainder of the service and laying our sister to rest. Calm our troubled hearts. Calm our grieving hearts. Comfort the family with your presence, your peace, and your promises. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Turn the time back over to Ray. following the shepherd. He wants to lead. Are we willing to follow? Sister Katie, physically she could not see in the latter years. But we in our spiritual realm often experience a lack of sight. We do. So we follow by faith, not by sight. In Psalm 23, our brother taught us that it restores our soul. He, this shepherd restores our soul. And in that restoration, it gives us assurance, not only in the life to come, but in the life that we now live. A question that was created in my mind, will we walk through that valley alone? It's a choice. It's a choice that you make. It's a choice that I make. And it's a choice that all eternity depends on where we will spend eternity and the assurance that we can hold onto that hand that leads us through that valley of the shadow of death. To where? To John 14, where he says, a place that is undescribable, a place of bliss. It humbles my heart to know that the sovereign creator of the universe 
was so concerned about every one of us that he's willing to prepare a place for us through eternity. But we must choose to be there. We must choose to be there. It's a prepared place for a prepared people, without exception, without exception. This brings this part of the service to a close. Just a couple of announcements before we turn the meeting over to Brother Willis and the ushers for the final viewing. We will have prayer here for the noon meal. And those of you that are not going to the cemetery, feel free to go to the basement and uh, the lunch will be uh, ready for you when you get there. And so feel free just to move to the basement and join in with the noon meal. I certainly want to thank those that have uh, taken their part in this service and uh, have uh, led us in worship this morning and uh, in a challenge of our walk with the Lord. So with that, I think we'll uh, just bow our heads for a word of prayer, and then we'll turn the time over to Brother Willis. Father, we thank you for being with us again this morning, blessing our uh, lives with an opportunity to serve you this morning. We thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We thank you for that shepherd that you have provided for each of us to reach out and to take the hand of that shepherd to guide us through life's experiences. And we thank you for the inspiration of your word and the challenge of your word this morning. We pray that it would prick our hearts and draw us closer to you and it would remind us of our frailty and the need of you in our own personal lives and we want to respond accordingly. And Lord, we just thank you for the natural uh, fruits of the earth, the food and, that you have provided in the basement. Bless the hands and the hearts that have prepared it and gave so generous, and we pray that your blessings upon it and our fellowship around the noon meal, that it would honor you. And I pray especially again for the family of the departed. We pray that you would just comfort them as only you can comfort, and you can draw them uh, close to you in the days to come as they make this adjustment. And as their lives take on a new normal, we pray that you would just give them direction, give them comfort, and just lead them in the paths in which you would have them to go. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Brother Willis.